I'm Canon Chris Pullin. I'm the Chancellor of Hereford Cathedral, and some have called that the best job in the Church of England. I don't disagree with them. I've studied Dante for 35 years and have found him endlessly fascinating. I made visits to Florence and Verona and Ravenna, cities which played such a big part in his life. I've taken people to Italy, Dante's Italy, which I've thoroughly enjoyed doing. And I've rejoiced that in Hereford Cathedral here we have some wonderful links with the world of Dante through some of the books on the shelves around me which date from his era and which indeed are books that he drew upon himself in his native Florence. W.B. Yeats, the Irish poet, said of Dante that he was the greatest imagination of Christendom. And T.S. Eliot, lots of other people have celebrated him as a great figure, a great Christian figure. So I want to share just a little bit, just scratch the surface, to do with Dante. He was born in 1265 to an old Florentine family, decayed aristocracy, we might say. Florence at that time was one of the leading cities of Europe. It was independent, it was burgeoning with a great expansion of wealth and culture, a great lay culture in Florence, in the arts, with poetry and painting, people like Guido Cavalcanti and uh, Giotto, and in terms of learning, Brunetto Latini had been a great teacher there, and his book, The Treasury, was a great source of learning for people. But it was a lay culture, and Dante uh, became part of that. It was a city, too, of terrible divisions. There were divisions between uh, what we might call family clans, so that where people uh, lived in the city uh, could determine everything to do with their lives. It was a dangerous place with great uh, rivalries and vendettas going on. It was divided as well between two European groups, the Guelphs, who broadly supported the Pope and looked to the Pope to help and look after them and their interests, and the Ghibellines, who looked to the Holy Roman Empire as the body that would look after them and best serve their interests. Florence was divided, had been divided. Before Dante was born, the Ghibellines were thrown out and the Guelphs came in. Dante married Gemma Donati, who was a rank above him socially. It was a good marriage, although it mixed him in with some bad people, ultimately. And he was overwhelmed as a youngster by Beatrice Portinari, who again was a rank above him. But in the terms of poetry, with Dante the poet, in that courtly love tradition was the unattainable lady. She died in 1290, and he says that he was completely devastated by her death. But uh, he turned to philosophy, and the poetry that he wrote, he was becoming known at that stage as a poet, um, he begins to talk about her and express ideas about her that later blossom tremendously in the Divine Comedy. In 1300, he was in the world of politics a bit, beginning to make his way, but that's when he fell foul of the divisions between the Guelphs and uh, the Donati family that he was married into, and he was exiled from Florence in about the year 1301, never to return the next 20 years before he died. He loved the city. He was deeply wounded by his exile. He wandered, he wrote, he was picked up by various patrons, Can Grande de la Scala in Verona, and finally Guido Novella in Ravenna, where he died in 1321. The greatest work, of course, and the one which is best known to us today, and which has so much to speak, even today, to Christian people, is the Divine Comedy, the Commedia. A journey through hell, up Mount Purgatory, and then ascending through the heavens to paradise. He sets it in the year 1300, when he's 35 years old. So symbolically, it's the middle of our three score years of ten. And he says in the famous opening lines of it that uh, in the middle of, of life's way, he found himself lost in a dark wood where the right road was wholly lost and gone. And 
The symbolism of the poetry is fantastic at so many levels, not least because he enters, he descends into hell on the evening of Good Friday, just as Christ is laid in the tomb. He emerges from hell on the shores of the mountain of purgatory uh, as dawn is breaking on Easter day. So he's gone through hell just as Christ harrows hell and he comes to his resurrection at that moment. And then he uh, climbs Mount Purgatory and ascends in Easter week through the heavens. It's been called the greatest Christian allegory ever written. It leads us symbolically from death to life, from sin to salvation, from ignorance to enlightenment, from darkness to light. 15,000 lines of some of the world's greatest poetry with a fantastic poetic architecture. 100 cantos divided with an introductory one, then 33 through hell, 33 up purgatory, 33 through paradise. The number three recurring again and again, the way that he sets the rhyme scheme and the tercets, the three-line verses that he uses. In the first part of the Commedia, he has a guide, Virgil, the classical poet born just before the Christian era. And it's Virgil who represents reason, we might say. He represents the best of what the human mind can achieve uh, unenlightened on its own. And he is hugely admired by Dante. We know this already. He's hugely admired as a poet and his, and, and his technique as a poet, but not just that, the things that he wrote about. In the Aeneid, he tells the story of Aeneas leaving Troy and coming to found Rome. And Rome is central to Dante's thought, its importance for the world. And uh, in that journey, Aeneas visits the underworld and makes a journey there. And that, of course, gives Dante already an idea for how he might begin to talk about things that are important to him. And in the fourth of his eclogues, Virgil has also written something which people in Dante's day took to be a prophecy of Christ from a classical author who never knew Christ but somehow intuited his coming. So for all those reasons he seemed to sum up for Dante all that was best in human reason and in the classical tradition. And that was good to get him through hell and to climb the mountain of purgatory. But at that point Virgil becomes flummoxed and runs out, at which moment Beatrice descends from heaven to, to take Dante through the heavens to paradise. We remember that she had been his unattainable lady of the courtly love tradition, uh, an erotic figure perhaps, but he now turns her into an icon of Christ. Somehow he, he has so reflected on things that he sees that human love is a kind of symbol of the divine love and this wondrous transformation that takes place. She's already fully enlightened as a soul in paradise and she completes his education, taking him through the heavens. All the way he meets people, just as he has in hell and purgatory, real people that he's known or that have been famous in times past and their stories and the explanations of those enlighten him. But even Beatrice can't bring him that final mystical vision of God. That mystical enlightenment is left to St. Bernard of Clairvaux, great 12th century figure who I think for Dante, who was very critical of the church, he loved it and everything and, and was so passionate about his faith that the failings of the medieval church disgusted him. Bernard of Clairvaux seemed to stand for what was best in Christianity. His simplicity as a Cistercian monk, his uncompromising uh, prophetic speaking truth to power both in church and in state, and his insight as a mystic who wrote about mystical things and led Dante to believe, I think, that, that he had a genuine vision of the things of God. All that Dante thought the church should be. Dante is so critical of the church, so critical of the state, and yet the Divine Comedy is this fantastic synthesis 
that brings together what could be the best in both in his great vision. And it's Bernard who brings him to the point where Dante drinks from light and sees in a new way everything, the whole universe, and says he can't express what he's seen, his mystical vision of God, of how things are that underlie everything, of how things should be and indeed can be. What does this all mean to us today as Christians in the 21st century? Dante sets out to answer some great dilemmas of his day and age, and I think they're dilemmas very often which are ours as well. What is the proper role of church and state? How do they relate together? What should they be? He sees twin sons in Rome, the emperor who should rule the world and make a safe haven for the pope to be able in peace and tranquility to bring people to spiritual maturity. But what in our day and age is, is the right relationship between church and state. He has this uh, expressed through Beatrice, erotic love, but spiritual love. And we see in the church today this terrible difficulty about knowing where sexuality and spirituality relate and, and how that should be. He is very interested in the questions of free will and determinism. Is it the stars that determine our actions or is it our own free will that, that makes those choices for us? And I think in our day we still talk about the debate between nature and nurture. Are we free or are we conditioned? It's an important thing for us as well to know about. And of course revelation and reason. How much can we know as humans by our own unaided effort? How much do we need uh, spiritual revelation to teach us and mature us and bring us to God? He makes us think about the reality of our moral choices, where we place ourselves in the end within a moral universe. Are we tending to God or are we tending to destruction? He inspires us with a vision of hope and beauty that can sustain us and inspire and encourage us still. So he challenges us and he feeds us. And I have never been disappointed by what he has offered me. He has changed my life 